He came into the league at a time where Europeans were still considered to be soft and more one-dimensional, but his playstyle didn't quite reflect that. Yeah, he possessed the traditional European player trait of being a sharpshooter, but he showed quickly that he was an all-around scorer who could put it on the floor and get to the hoop when he needed to. He was at his best off the ball, as even at close to 7 feet tall, he was the perfect player for the great motion offense of the early 2000s Kings teams. And Peja Stojakovic put all those tools to use, as he became one of the top players and scorers in the league during his prime. And although he wouldn't get over the hump with those elite Kings teams, he still got a ring, playing as a key piece to the Dallas Mavericks 2011 playoff run. His numbers declined once he left Sacramento, but that was more because injuries started to catch up to him and struggling with back and neck issues are some of the worst ailments an NBA player can have. But he still remained effective until the very end. But it was the determination and work ethic of Peja Stojakovic that set him apart, as his basketball career was the ticket to giving him and his family a safe life away from the wars he grew up around. And Stojakovic made sure he didn't let that opportunity slip away, as he put together one of the more underrated careers of the 21st century, and one that we're going to look at on today's episode. Let's jog your memory. As a child, Peja Stojakovic was living in the town of Pozega in East Croatia. At the age of 13, he fled with his family to Belgrade, Serbia due to the Yugoslav Wars. His family had lost everything, but they were now living in the basketball mecca of southeastern Europe. And a 14-year-old Stojakovic, standing at 6'4", tried out for the Red Star Belgrade and made it on their junior team. By 15 years old, he was playing on the senior team and would be a part of their 1993 national championship winning squad. Stojakovic would eventually be offered a five-year contract with the team, but would turn it down for a contract with PAOK in the Greek League, as it would give his family the opportunity to escape war-torn Yugoslavia. After waiting a year for Greek citizenship, Stojakovic made his debut during the 95 season, and in just his first year would help the team capture the Greek Cup, as he had now firmly placed himself on the NBA's radar as fellow Serbian and future teammate Vlade Divac would say that he was already making a name for himself. The Kings had also drafted Lawrence Funderburk in 1994, and he would sign on to the same club as Stojakovic for the 96 season, where he would also go on to rave about Stojakovic's potential and drive to be a great NBA player. And if that wasn't enough, NBA Hall of Famer Dominique Wilkins, who spent the 96 season playing in the same league as Stojakovic, had nothing but praise for the young player. The Kings really liked what they saw in Peja, as they had worked him out twice prior to the 96 draft, and he was respected enough to attend the draft in person, and have a seat in the green room. And then about midway through the first round, immediately after the Hornets selection of Kobe Bryant, David Stern said the words that would change Stojakovic's life forever. With the 14th pick in the 1996 NBA draft, the Sacramento Kings select Predrag Stojakovic from Pauk in Greece. At the time of his selection, Stojakovic was a couple weeks past his 19th birthday, and he reportedly felt ready to join the Kings immediately. However, his father felt that he needed more time overseas before making the jump to the NBA. But the real hang-up was that Stojakovic couldn't get out of his contract in Greece. According to Peja, the owner didn't want any money, he just wanted his star player to continue playing for the team for the remaining two years of Stojakovic's contract. So that's what he would do. Returning to the team for the 97 season, he would be voted a Greek League All-Star and win MVP of the All-Star game. Then, in 1998, he would lead the EuroLeague in scoring with an average of 23.9 points per game, along with 4.5 rebounds and 2.5 assists, en route to winning Greek League MVP, and would defeat defending champion Olympiakos on a buzzer beater three, but would go on to lose in the final, as he was neutralized by his future head coach, Byron Scott. But Stojakovic had fulfilled his responsibility and was now set to join the Kings for the lockout shortened 1999 season. Had Stojakovic joined the team in 96, he would have been joining a Kings team coming off their first playoff appearance in over a decade, led by aging star Mitch Richmond. But going into 1999, the Kings were a far cry from that team. During the previous year's playoffs, they had packaged Richmond in a trade to Washington for star big man Chris Webber. They had also signed free agent center Vlade Divac to a six-year contract in January. Additionally, they had hired Rick Adelman to be their head coach and had drafted Florida point guard Jason Williams. And the Kings would show improvement from the jump, as although it was only a 50-game season, the Kings' 27-23 record would be their first time over 500 since 1983. 
as they would show the beginnings of their motion-heavy, greatest show-on-court offense. And as a rookie, the now 6'10 Stoyakovich would play respectable minutes in a bench role, as Corliss Williamson was the team's starting small forward. And although Stoyakovich could have complained, he instead relied on his work ethic and lived in the gym, while also relying on Divock for guidance and support. Stoyakovich ended up as part of a strong bench unit, featuring former teammate Funderburk and veteran Vernon Maxwell, and would even lead the team in free throw percentage at over 85%. With the highlight of his season coming during a March 30th overtime win versus Utah, in which he played over 43 minutes off the bench, scoring 26 points and hitting 5 threes. And the Kings record got them a postseason matchup with the Jazz. And although the Kings got up 2-1, they would lose the final two games and the series. Stojakovic would get solid minutes, but not a lot of shot opportunities, and would fail to crack double figures in any of the five games. And his regular season averages looked like about 8.5 points, 3 rebounds, and 1.5 and assists per game. The Kings had traded for Nick Anderson during the offseason, who hadn't been the same player since his free throw line meltdown in the 1995 NBA Finals. Maxwell had signed with the Sonics, meaning Stojakovic would now be the team's sixth man going into the 2000 season. Weber was entering his prime as the unquestioned leader of the Kings, but Stojakovic had improved his contributions as his scoring went up by 3.5 points to finish fourth on the team and be the only non-starter to average double figures, as he would improve his shooting to nearly 45% from the field and again be the team's top free throw shooter at over 88%. He would have 43 games in double figures, including his first 30-point game in a February 21st loss to Denver. The Kings had the top-ranked scoring offense and the highest pace in the league, but also a bottom three defense, yet they would still finish at 44 and 38 to make their second straight playoff appearance, this time versus Shaq, Kobe, and the LA Lakers. The Lakers would take the first two in LA before the Kings even the series by taking the next two in Sacramento, but would then be blown out in Game 5 to lose the series. Stojakovic started the series slow, going a combined 2 for 12 for a total of 6 points in the first two games, but would then score 19 in Game 3 and 11 in Game 2, but finish with just 8 points in Game 5. And for his improved sophomore season, he would average about 12 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 1.5 and assists per game. With Stojakovic's improvement, along with him being a better fit for Adelman's system, the Kings traded Corliss Williamson to Toronto for Doug Christie, who would become a perfect fit on this team. So now the Kings featured their usual starters of Weber, Divock, and Williams, but would now add Christie and Stojakovic to the starting lineup. Additionally, they added Hito Turkoglu through the draft, and also signed free agent Bobby Jackson. Stojakovic would have a breakout year. He would play and start in 75 games, and would combine with Weber to average over 47 points per game. He continued to shoot above 85% from the free throw line, and would have his first season shooting at least 40% from deep, as he would participate in the three-point shootout, and finish as a runner-up. He would have 68 games in double figures, as well as seven games with at least 30 and would pull down a career-high 17 rebounds in a November 11th loss to the Lakers. Stojakovic would finish as a top 25 scorer in the league, and be second in most improved player voting. The Kings still had the best offense, but also had a much improved defense, as they would finish 55-27, and, and get a first round matchup with Phoenix. Stojakovic would have a 13.10 rebound double-double in Game 1, and would then average 21.5 points over the next two games before finishing the series strong with a game-high 37 points on over 55% shooting while going 14 of 14 from the charity stripe as the Kings won in four games in their first playoff series victory since 1981. Round 2 brought a rematch with the Lakers, and although three games were decided by six points or less, the Lakers would still sweep the Kings, ending their season. Stojakovic would score less than 20 in just one game, but would also shoot above 39% in just one game as well so his regular season would end with him averaging about 20.5 points, 6 rebounds, and 2 assists per game. Jason Williams had a terrible series versus LA, as his minutes decreased significantly, and as exciting and flashy as Williams was, he had already indicated he would welcome a trade earlier in the season, and the Kings were ready to move on from his erratic play, as they needed someone more reliable to run their offense. So on June 27th, they sent Williams and Nick Anderson to Memphis, for Mike Bibby and Brent Price. So now the Kings had the final piece to the greatest show on court, were bringing back virtually the same roster, and had added a high-energy rookie in Gerald Wallace. They continued to be one of the top offenses in the league, 
as all five starters averaged at least 11 points per game, and no one shot below 45%. And with an improved defense, they finished with the league best record of 61 and 21. Stojakovic would be voted to his first career All-Star game and would also participate in and win the three-point shootout as he would become the first European-born player to win an All-Star weekend competition. He continued to improve his scoring as he would be tied for top 15 in the league, and he shot a career-high 48.4% from the field, and a then-career-high 41.6% from deep. He would play in 71 games, scoring in double figures in 66 of them. And the Kings would end the year on a tear as well, as they won 12 of their final 14 games, including an 11-game win streak. The top-seeded Kings began with the first-round matchup versus Utah, which the Kings would win in four games. Stojakovic would start slow, but still finish second on the team in scoring, as one of two players with over 20 points per game. He would average just over 17 points on only 34% shooting in the first three games, but would score a game-high 30 on over 69% shooting in the series-clinching Game 4 win. The second round brought Dallas and Stojakovic started strong, with a game-high 26 points and 10 rebounds in a Game 1 win. He would have another double-double with 14 and 12 in Game 2, but do so on just over 26% shooting in a loss. He started slow in Game 3, going 1 for 7 from the field. Then in the third quarter, he badly sprained his ankle and had to be carted off the court. Luckily, the Kings would go on to win this game and the next two to advance to the Conference Finals as Hito Turkoglu filled in well for Stojakovic. The conference finals brought a matchup with the Lakers for the third straight season, but Stojakovic's ankle was bad, and he would miss the first four games of the series, which the team split. However, the Kings were seconds away from going up 3-1, until, while both teams were fighting for a rebound at the end of the game, the ball found its way to Robert Ori at the top of the arc, who hit a game-winning three-pointer at the buzzer. Stojakovic returned in Game 5, coming off the bench, which he would do for the remainder of the series but he would score just two points. However, he would secure a crucial rebound in the final seconds to prevent LA from getting a game-winning shot opportunity after Bibby had hit a go-ahead shot that would end up being the game winner with less than 10 seconds left in the game. But even with Stojakovic back, an ankle injury was one of the last injuries you wanted him to have as his game was so dependent on his off-the-ball movement and quick cuts, which his ankle prevented him from doing and limited him to being more of a spot-up shooter. So the Kings were going into Game 6, up 3-2, with an opportunity to close out the series. But then the most controversial playoff game in NBA history occurred. This game overall was filled with head-scratching calls and no calls, but it was in the fourth quarter when it was at its worst, as the Lakers would be awarded 27 free throws in the quarter. Two more than Sacramento had shot all game. And the most infamous no call would be when Kobe Bryant caught Mike Bibby with an elbow across the face while trying to get open for an inbounds pass. Stojakovic would have 10 points off the bench, but the Kings would lose by 4, as the Lakers had forced a Game 7. And although Game 7 would still be close, the Lakers would win by 6 to take the series, as Stojakovic put up just 8 points on 25% shooting. So it would be a heartbreaking end to a dream season. But for the regular season, Stojakovic would average about 21 points, 5.5 rebounds, and 2.5 assists per game. Stojakovic would be able to celebrate something over the summer, as he helped lead Yugoslavia to a gold medal in the FIBA World Championships. The 03 Kings continued to be one of the best teams in the league, and finished with the third best record in the West and in the league, at 59 and 23, which is even more impressive considering Weber missed 15 games and Bibby missed 27. Stojakovic's scoring dropped slightly, but he would still be second on the team and shoot over 48% from the field and over 38% from three. He would score double figures in 65 out of 72 games and have 8 games with at least 30. He would earn his second consecutive All-Star selection and would also win his second consecutive 3-point shootout crown. The Kings would enter the playoffs with a first round matchup versus the final season of the Stockton and Malone-led Utah Jazz. And Stojakovic would go on a tear to begin the postseason, as he would lead the team in scoring at 22.6 points per game, while shooting nearly 55% from the field and nearly 58% from deep as he would have three games with at least 22 points in a five-game series win for the Kings. They would draw the Mavs in round two, and Stojakovic continued his dominance, as he would put up a game-high 26 on over 61% shooting in a game one win. But with the Kings down by 26 late in the third quarter of game two, disaster would strike again. Chris Webber had torn his ACL after putting up 31 points, ending his postseason and dealing a major blow to the Kings. 
Stojakovic had added 24 of his own on over 53% shooting, and then came back in Game 3 with a postseason career high of 39 in a 4-point loss. But he struggled the rest of the way, as he cracked 20 points just one more time in the series, and also shot above 35% just one more time. And even though the Kings took it to a Game 7, they would unfortunately lose the series, which would bring concerns and questions around if they could ever return to the team they were once Weber came back from his serious injury. But for the regular season, Stojakovic averaged about 19 points, 5.5 rebounds, and 2 assists per game. The 4 Kings were already beginning to look different. They would complete an offseason sign and trade with Indiana to acquire All-Star center Brad Miller but would also send Turkoglu to San Antonio in the same deal. Even without Weber for the first three quarters of the year, and Bobby Jackson missing 32 games, the Kings were able to remain a top offense, as Bibby had taken a big step. But it was Stojakovic who took on the main responsibility to lead the team, as he had the best season of his career. He would play and start in a career-high 81 games, while averaging a career-high 24.2 points per game, which was good for second in the league behind only Tracy McGrady. He would be voted to his third consecutive, yet final All-Star game of his career, and would even finish fourth in MVP voting, while leading the league in free throw percentage, and shooting a then career high 43.3% from deep. He would score double figures in every game he played in, and notch his first career 40 point game, with 41 on December 23rd versus Memphis. Weber was inactive until mid-February, but upon activation, he would have to serve an eight game suspension, as he was suspended three games for lying to a grand jury about receiving unauthorized benefits during his time with Michigan, and another five games for violating the league's substance abuse policy. The Kings were sitting at 44 and 15 when Weber returned, but they would struggle to find their footing and go just 11 and 12 the rest of the way to finish 55 and 27. Their first round series would be a rematch versus the team who Weber had injured himself against a year prior. And although three of the Kings' four wins came by four points or less, they were still able to finish off the Mavs in five games. Weber played solid with 19 and 9, and Bibby put up close to 24, but Stojakovic again had postseason inconsistency, as he would put up about 18 points on about 42% from the field and less than 29% from deep. He did start the series great with a team high 28, and would also end strong with 23 and 10 on nearly 59% shooting. Round 2 brought the Minnesota Timberwolves, led by MVP Kevin Garnett along with Latrell Sprewell and Sam Cassell. This would be a great hard-fought series, which Minnesota would ultimately win in seven games. But both Stojakovic and Bibby would have trouble, as neither shot above 39%. And although Stojakovic would drop 26 in Game 2 and 29 in Game 3, he would have just 8 points on 3 of 12 shooting in the series deciding Game 7, and his career year would end with him averaging a career-high 24.2 points, a career-high 6.3 rebounds, and a career-high 1.3 steals per game, as he would be named second-team All-NBA. The Kings elected not to re-sign Divock, and he would sign on with the team he started his career with. The Kings had also lost Gerald Wallace in the expansion draft, but the dominoes began to fall mid-season, as with the Kings sitting at 21-11, they sent Doug Christie to the Magic for Catino Mobley. Then on February 23rd, they completed a blockbuster deal, Five-time All-Star Chris Webber dealt by Sacramento to Philadelphia, the fourth trade and fourth NBA stop of his career. The Kings would deal with injuries as well, as Miller would miss 26 games and Stojakovic would miss 16. Bibby had asserted himself as arguably the team's top player, but Stojakovic would still remain the team's top scorer. And although his shooting percentage dropped to the lowest it had been since his rookie year, he still shot over 40% from deep and over 90% from the line. The Kings were 34 and 20 when they made the Weber trade and would still go 16 and 12 the rest of the way as their top acquisitions of Mobley and Kenny Thomas provided solid contributions. Sacramento would get the Seattle Supersonics in the first round of the playoffs, but for the first time in five seasons, they would lose in the first round. Stojakovic would have a good series as he led the team in scoring and shot 47% from the field including 27 in Game 4 and 38 in Game 5. But Ray Allen was lights out, averaging over 32 per game for the series, as Seattle won in 5 games. And for the regular season, Stojakovic averaged about 20 points, 4 rebounds, and 2 assists per game. The trades over the course of the year made it pretty clear that the Kings were going into a rebuild. And this continued as they traded Bobby Jackson and Greg Ostertag to the Grizzlies for Bonzi Wells, and had also signed free agent Sharif Abdurrahim in the offseason. 
Stoyakovic started the year with Sacramento, but was struggling as his numbers were down across the board, and it likely didn't help that his name was linked to a trade with troubled Pacers forward Ron Artest since the beginning of the year. A trade that probably would have been completed much earlier had Artest not said that he did not want to go to Sacramento. Stoyakovic would have his lowest scoring average since he became a starter, and the Kings were sitting at 17-24. and 24. When on January 25th, the trade finally went through, and Stoyakovic was sent to Indiana for our test. Stoyakovic would join a Pacers team led by Jermaine O'Neal and Steven Jackson, but O'Neal was beginning to break down and would only play 51 games this year. But Stoyakovic would see improvement, as his scoring and shooting would improve significantly in his 40 games with Indiana, as they would go 20 and 20 after acquiring Stoyakovic and finish the year at 41 and 41 and make the playoffs with a matchup versus New Jersey. And although Stoyakovic played 71 games this year, he struggled with back and knee injuries. So he wasn't at 100% going into the series. But he still played 26 minutes and scored 12 points in a Game 1 win. But his knee would flare up before Game 2, forcing him to sit out as the Nets even the series. He would return for Game 3 and scored 10 points in about 25 minutes of action in another win. But then his knee would shut him down for the rest of the series. And on top of losing his scoring, the Pacers also lost his floor spacing, which opened up the paint for O'Neal. And without Stoyakovic, the Pacers lost three straight in the series. And for his regular season, he averaged about 18 points, six rebounds, and two assists per game. During the offseason, the Pacers and Hornets would complete a sign in trade that would see Stoyakovic end up in New Orleans with a new five-year, $64 million deal, as he was one of two major acquisitions for a Hornets team led by Chris Paul and David West, as they had also made an off-season trade for Bulls center Tyson Chandler. And the Hornets looked good to begin the year, as they started 8-5, with Stoyakovic averaging nearly 18 a game and shooting over 40% from deep, including a career-high 42 points in a November 14th win versus Charlotte, where he would become the first player in NBA history to score the first 20 points of the game for his team. But then Stoyakovic started suffering from back spasms, which he would eventually get surgery for. And this surgery would end his year, as the Hornets finished 39-43 and 43 and missed the playoffs. And in his 13 games, Stoyakovic averaged about 18 points, 4 rebounds, and 1 assist per game. Stoyakovic came back healthy for the 08 season, as he would play and start in 77 games. He would be a perfect floor spacer and transition shooter for the Hornets, as he finished third on the team in scoring while shooting a career-high 44.1% from three, which was good for fourth in the league, and would have 36 points on a career-high 10 three-pointers versus the Lakers on November 6th. Additionally, he would lead the league in free throw percentage for the second time in his career. Chris Paul would lead the league in assists and steals, and Chandler would finish third in the league in rebounds. And Byron Scott would win coach of the year after leading the Hornets to a franchise record of 56 and 26. The Hornets would defeat the Mavericks pretty convincingly in a five-game first-round series, as Toyakovic would average about 16 points per game while shooting over 60% from deep on nearly six attempts per game. Round two brought the defending champion Spurs, and the Hornets would blow out the Spurs in games one and two, with Stoyakovic dropping 22 in game one and 25 in game two, on a combined seven of 11 from three. But the Spurs would adjust and end up coming back and winning the series in seven games. Stoyakovic would really cool off over the next five games, as he would crack double figures just one more time in the series and shoot over 38% from the field just one more time. But it was still a memorable season for the Hornets that saw Stoyakovic average about 16.5 points, 4.5 rebounds, and 1 assist per game. The Hornets remained competitive but struggled with injuries this year. Stoyakovic continued to be hampered by a bad back and would miss 21 games. His scoring average would drop more than three points from the previous year, and he would struggle from the field, shooting below 40%. Additionally, Chandler would miss 12 games around the All-Star break with a sprained ankle. And then on February 17th, he was traded to OKC. But during his physical, the Thunder ruled that his big toe, which he had surgery on the year prior, was too high of a risk for re-injury, and rescinded the trade. Chandler would go on to miss 29 of the team's final 44 games as the Hornets finished 49-33, and, and would get a matchup with Denver in the first round. The Nuggets would win the first two games convincingly before the Hornets stole Game 3, but then the Nuggets proceeded to blow out New Orleans the next two games, including a 58-point Game 4 victory to win the series. The entire Hornets team struggled, and Stoyakovic was no exception. 
Although he started strong, averaging 15 points on over 50% shooting in the first two games, he averaged less than 9 points on 8 for 30 shooting in the final three. And for the regular season, he would put up about 13.5 points, 4.5 rebounds, and 1 assist per game. During this offseason, a trade was completed that saw Chandler sent to the Bobcats in exchange for Emeka Okafor. So that was a big blow to the Hornets. And on top of that, after a 3-6 and six start to the year, Byron Scott was fired. But the biggest blow came in early February, when Chris Paul tore cartilage in his knee that would force him to miss significant time, as overall he would appear in just 45 games this season. Stojakovic had began the year in a bench role, in an effort to preserve his body for the long season. But after the firing of Scott, he would return to the starting lineup. And he would play quite well, as his back wasn't bothering him for the first time in years. He would shoot over 40% from the field and over 37% from three. But during the time Paul was out, he was also putting the ball on the floor more than he had in years and was rebounding quite well. Unfortunately, an abdominal injury would end Stojakovic's season in early March, as he would sit out the final 17 games for a Hornets team that went 37 and 45 and missed the playoffs. And Stojakovic would average about 12.5 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 1.5 assists per game. The 2011 season would consist of a few stops for Stojakovic. He would begin the year in a bench role on the Hornets, where he would be putting up the lowest numbers of his career, yet would also be quite efficient. But after playing just 6 games, he was part of a package along with Jared Bayless that was sent to the Raptors for a package headlined by Jared Jack. He would play in 2 games with Toronto, averaging 10 points on 70% shooting, but then a knee injury in late November would sideline him indefinitely until he was released on January 20th. A few days later, he would sign on with the Dallas Mavericks and reunite with his New Orleans teammate, as he would appear in 25 games and average about 8.5 points on 40% from deep. But it was during the Mavs' 2011 playoff run that he would really prove his worth. He would average just 7 points over his 19 postseason appearances and only have 4 games in double figures. But this did include a 21 point game 2 performance versus Portland in the first round where he would shoot over 61% from the field and drain 5 threes. He would have his best series in the second round versus LA as he would have a 10 point game 1, then a 15 point game 3, and a 21 point game 4 on 6 of 6 from deep as the Mavs swept the defending champs. Stojakovic would be pretty quiet for the remainder of the playoffs versus OKC in the Western Conference Finals and then Miami in the Finals but he had still given the Mavs crucial points, floor spacing, and size en route to their first title in franchise history, as Stojakovic was finally a champion after 13 years. And for the regular season, he averaged about 8.5 points, 2.5 rebounds, and 1 assist per game. And Peja Stojakovic would go out on top, as he would announce his retirement in December of 2011, prior to the lockout shortened season. He overcame all odds and huge adversity to escape a war-torn country and come to the NBA. And once he got there, he didn't just stick around, he excelled and at times dominated, as there's not many players who've ever finished top 5 in MVP voting. Like most Europeans, his main point of attraction was his knockdown shooting, but he proved to be so much more than just a spot-up shooter. He had a decent handle for someone his size and wasn't afraid to drive to the hoop and take the contact. His height at the small forward position led to him creating many mismatches, especially due to his ability to run defenders ragged off the ball for open looks. He wasn't a lockdown defender, but his length and instinct made it easier for him to jump passing lanes and poke balls loose, as he averaged nearly a steal per game for his career. And he'll never be forgotten for the role he played in Sacramento, but he seems to be remembered as more one-dimensional than he really was. And although injuries accelerated his decline, he was a key contributor for every team he suited up for. And at the end of the day, Peja Stojakovic helped change the narrative on European players. And that's something that'll never be forgotten. But that's it for today's episode on Peja Stojakovic. Hope you enjoyed it and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. If you like this one, check out this one on a player he won a chip in Dallas with. Or this one on his brief teammate in Indiana. Thanks for watching and see you next time.